Hi, and thank you for joining me for another video. And friends, being that it's so close to Pesach, I thought I should make a short lecture on kidney oat. What are kidney oat? Well, the word literally just means beans or legumes in Hebrew. It's actually derived from the word for small, katan. So when used in connection with Pesach or Passover, it also includes certain grains. In other words, it's a category of legumes and grains that are certainly, from a Talmudic perspective, not chametz and can technically be eaten and cooked with on Pesach without a fear of them ever becoming chametz. Now, this issue is not as simple as some may think, because technically, at least from a categorical perspective, some kidneyot are chametz. For example, the only way we can fulfill the mitzvah of eating matzvah on Pesach is by consuming Kidney oat, for example, the five grains or types of wheat that were prohibited from allowing to leaven during Pesach are technically all kidney oat, right? Wheat, barley, spelt, rye, and oats, which are the only five grains that matzah can be created from to fulfill the mitzvah of consuming matzah. There actually was a sage, Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri, in the Mishnah, who was of the opinion that rice was also counted alongside these five grains. An idea obviously rejected by the ruling body, which is why, as you know, rice is considered permissible, at least Talmudically or halakhically, as a permitted form of kidney oat that could be consumed during Pesach. However, if any of these five grains that I just mentioned were allowed to leaven, or let's say ferment, past 18 minutes, they would become chametz. And the reason, friends, I'm telling you this is, first to let you know that it was ultimately the court that decided which grains or types of wheat would be relevant during Pesach. Pesach, and which would not. Even though we do see wheat and barley mentioned side by side in the biblical narrative, initially giving us the assumption that these existed in the time, at least for making bread. But anyways, this reminds us on how important it is to have and to adhere to a court, which if you think about it, would make it a bit impossible to properly, at least from a unified manner, fulfill the mitzvah of eating matzah on Pesach. And the reason, friends, this is important to understand is because this will ultimately lay down why the virtually complete prohibition against what is known as kidney oath is not just baseless, but actually from a rabbinic perspective, anti-Torah. And this is why I just can't speak on kidney oath on the fly without first revealing the greater problem that has created issues like this from even arising. Because technically there is no food that is prohibited on Pesach. The only prohibition lies in the fermenting or leavening of certain products. And again, this is relevant because the whole case of what is or is not chametz or can become chametz exists outside the literal text of Torah. And the Torah in this case makes us rely on a ruling body, i.e. the Sanhedrin. So how can some later group classify anything as permitted or forbidden? And this is the real question I will try to cover with this lecture, even though it's not really as clear-cut as it seems. And friends, I'm in no way stating that the rabbis who are the proponents of no kidney oat during Pesach assume in any way that this prohibition is Talmudically binding, although I'm sure you'll meet many, many individuals who believe it is, just because they don't know. Instead of what it always was, just the customs of a certain community, which is really where the problem began, mainly because they cease making the distinction between what's incorrigible, universal, and halakhically binding, and what's a local custom with an expiration date, an expiration limited to the facts on the ground. Let me explain further. Why was there ever a prohibition put on kidney oat in the first place? Well, although there are different reasons for the ban, I would say the most prevalent one was because kidney oat products were at one time stored alongside those products that can become chametz. So a well-intentioned effort was made by the European rabbis at that time to help prevent someone from accidentally eating chametz during Pesach. Because as we know, that the penalty for at least deliberately consuming chametz during Pesach incurs the harshest penalty of them all, which is karet. In other words, every one of us would have done the same thing. So no, friends, the problem didn't begin with the initial prohibition of kidney oat, but rather with it becoming permanent doctrinal law once the reason for it being created in the first place became irrelevant. Now, those who have heard my previous lectures know that only the Sanhedrin could establish binding rulings. So you're probably thinking, how can anyone establish anything after their disbandment? Now, although it's true that no one after the Sanhedrin could establish rules binding from a Torah perspective, as was mentioned in Parashat Shoftim, 
However, from a communal level, Israel still had and has a responsibility to keep the group progressing uniformly, which is what we saw with many leading authorities establishing communal practices from the Reish Galuta to the Geonim, the heads of the two Babylonian yeshivot, which again, is known as communal law and not, not in any way rabbinic or Torah law. So how would communal law differ from rabbinic law? For example, if someone broke communal law, they would not be violating any Torah prohibition. Unlike if someone broke a law from the Great Sanhedrin that rules from the Temple Mount, which would then make them violate the mitzvah of lotus or of straying from the rulings of that court, right, that appears in Deuteronomy 17 and other places in Torah. Now, if one broke one of these laws, one of these communal laws, or even rabbinic laws, they would not have to do teshuvah or bring a korban, but they would still be subject to the punishments created by that body that created these laws, whether it was a Sanhedrin or that communal ruling body. But most prevalent between their distinction is the fact that the longevity of the rulings of the great court, unlike those of the communal courts, were not limited to time and circumstance. In other words, many ask the question that is actually relevant to Passover, as it is to any other Torah holiday, which is why do we keep a two-day holiday on these days when the reason for keeping two days is no longer relevant anymore? In other words... Back then, the whole Jewish calendar was determined by the court, ruling the beginning of the month into existence, a ruling that was determined by witnesses spotting the new moon, and the court ruling based on their testimony. Now, this ruling would not travel fast enough to reach Jews living outside of the land of Israel, so they ruled that everyone outside of its borders should always keep two days of a holiday just to be safe, with the exception of Rosh Hashanah, which was even kept for two days within Israel. So why do we continue keeping a two-day holiday, even though nowadays we have greater communication than before? In other words, we could get the word out fast enough. And better yet, why do we continue keeping a two-day holiday if we no longer have a Sanhedrin? In other words, we don't determine the new month by the moon anymore. We use a calculated calendar, also established by the Sanhedrin, until we actually put them back on the Temple Mount. And the answer is that because it was a ruling by the great court, that ruling could not be abolished by any other court but the Sanhedrin itself. Which, if you think about it, is the way virtually every legal system functions. And as you know, the prohibition of Kidiot was only a communal law. Also, like we said earlier, that the problem is that people have really ceased making a distinction between communal law and rabbinic law. Which is why I don't think it's so important quoting modern rabbis who happen to agree with eating Kidiot to prove our point, mainly because you would be falling into the same trap again of letting others do the thinking for you. Now many would think that this lecture should end here, but as you know, that we at Dordea do not tell you what to think, but rather we teach you how to think halakhically. And this is why I'm going to attempt to get to the source of the problem, which I don't have to tell you surpasses the union of Kitniot on Pesach. Because, friends, I can assure you that those who were once strict on not consuming Kitniot during Pesach and then came around to the realization that it was never truly prohibited have a double standard in other areas of Jewish practice, mainly because of the lack of halachic clarity in the Jewish world today. Things like dressing up on Purim, Simchas Torah, the mourner's Kaddish, eating dairy on Shavuot, no weddings during the three weeks or during the counting of the Omer, and on and on. Friends, if we're going to make a distinction between what's halachically binding and what's not, why are people till today asked to leave synagogues for not standing for the prayer for the state of Israel? Or why do people insist that converts should be turned away when, again, there is no binding law that commands us to do so? And not to mention customs that arose out of mystical ideas themselves, which were never tied into some practical reality. Because the truth is that people do what they want and accept or reject whatever they want on the basis of what pleases them or displeases them. But regardless, friends, you're not prohibited from depriving yourself from kidney out on Pesach. In other words, Ashkenazim and any other group can permit or allow any acceptable thing they want. No, friends, the problem begins when you begin encouraging others to do the same as if you were sharing some Torah or rabbinic truth or law. And worse, when you begin looking down on others for doing differently than you do. So this lecture is in no way an excuse to attack others who choose to deprive themselves of kidney oil during Pesach. Of course, as long as they do not in any way distort Torah by telling others that it's binding in any way. Which is pretty much what they're doing when they basically prohibit kidney oil products from certain communities or make it virtually impossible to find just because they have honestly erroneously begun to think that kidney oil is a form of chametz. Which I have to tell you, already has happened with the whole concept of soft 
matzot for Pesach. In other words, they have labeled it as chametz when it was always the Talmudic standard. And before I end, I think I need to clear up a misconception floating around there that has others not only buying into the notion of no kidney yield, but every other basis custom that Israel has today. And that's the notion of tradition or Masora. Because this often happens. You have someone asking a question on many things that we do in Judaism, and many times the response they get, at least for the reason for what we do, is because of tradition. And the truth is that the word tradition or Masora in Hebrew does not mean the same in Judaism as it does in other societies. For example, in Judaism, every Masora must derive from a ruling. Remember what I just said, friends, that every Masora must derive from a ruling. And regarding a ruling, meaning a ruling of the Sanhedrin. In other words, in Judaism, the word Masora does not simply mean any old tradition that only because it's old we are in some way bound to uphold it. And the only way it resembles the modern understanding of the word is that every ruling was upheld by later generations like an unbroken chain till that law was obviously abolished or it ceased because of another ruling of the Sanhedrin. And the reason, friends, this is so important is that many, in an attempt to justify unhalachic practices, will just say that it is our tradition and say something like, tradition is very important in Judaism, which in reality, at least from the simplistic meaning, it is not. As a matter of fact, the word Kabbalah, the word that is used for mysticism in Judaism nowadays, actually means tradition or something transmitted or handed down. But anyways, that's another lecture in itself. Not to say that from a personal perspective, Judaism frowns upon the other form of tradition. For example, if you have a tradition of eating matzah ball soup on Shabbat, and in no way are tying this in doctrinally to Judaism, you can continue your personal custom or tradition. But anyways, friends, back to kidney oat. Here are a list of foods that make up the family of kidney oat that you could be enjoying this Pesach. So, long story short, you're free to enjoy kidney oat products on Pesach, even if you're Ashkenazi, mainly because the actual reason for the communal prohibition expired long ago. And not to mention that we have many sources that teach that this custom was never widely embraced among the Ashkenazi community, even back then when it came out. So, ultimately, it's not a Ashkenazi versus Sephardi issue. With the exception that Spartum never entertained the reasoning behind this communal prohibition to begin with. So, friends, for more information on everything Jewish, please visit BeJewish.org. Thank you.